My name is Meita, I'm the community shlicha. I'm the community shlicha at the JCC. Um, I got here to Memphis almost two years ago. Um, this is our fourth Mifgashim session. Mifgashim in Hebrew is meetings, like gatherings. Um, and the idea is really where the Israel society meets the American society, the Memphis society, or however you want to look at it, um, in all different social issues that we are talking about. And today we're here going to talk about the Holocaust. Um, and we are honored to have Rachel Shankman with us. Um, so Rachel, beside helping lead this specific session, she is part of my committee for the whole uh, program and she is amazing, amazing, amazing. Um, so Rachel, as you all must know, she was the founder of the Memphis Office of Facing History in Ourselves. She was in this position for 22 years, right? 22 Correct. Years. Until 2014. Prior to that, she was the director of Jewish Student Union at the University of Memphis, the educational director of Bet Shalom Synagogue, the regional director of Bnei Brit Youth Organization, and many more other stuff. Right, um, so we can... <laughs> Thank it. you, it's a great introduction. <laughs> and the last thing, that um, she is the daughter of uh, Holocaust survivor parents. She was born in um, this place, person's um, camp in Munich. And I think, yeah, that's, that's most of it. There's a lot more. <laughs> and with this introduction, I will let Rachel to start. And okay. All right. Thank you so much, Matav. And thank you all for joining us tonight. It's, it's really a thrill to see you um, and to know of your interest uh, in this really important subject. To kick us off, if, if we could get the technology to work, we're going to show a very, very quick uh, sort of uh, person on the street interview uh, that took place a few years ago in New York City to sort of gather our thoughts about what people know or don't know about the Holocaust. So, Matab, let's see if we can do that for everybody. Matab, I'm not hearing it. Are you hearing it? I see it, but don't hear it. Sorry, start again. But I can't either. Matab, we can't hear it. Matab? What happened? You can't hear it. You can't hear it? Uh uh. L let, let's cut it. That's fine. Okay. Sorry. That's weird. Um. Hey, Tav, can you post the link for it? I will post the link for it. Okay, thank you. Okay, I tell you what, why don't we skip it for now and, and as a follow up, we'll be glad to send the, um, the link to it. But basically, uh, it, it's a pretty startling thing that these young people in New York City, particularly New York, where it's such a 
large Jewish community um, do not know very much about uh, what the Holocaust was. Um, think it's everything from a Jewish holiday <laughs> to something to do with Jews, but really don't have a real strong sense of it. So it, that was startling to see for many of us for whom the Holocaust has either been a real you know, integral part of our lives for a long time, or we've studied it, um, to, to think that only a few years ago, uh, that it wasn't so well understood or well known. And in 2018, there was a survey um, that noted that 66% of American millennials uh, cannot explain, don't know what Auschwitz is. Um, and that 41% believed that less than 2 million Jews were killed, murdered during the Holocaust. So again, it's, it's sort of um, counterintuitive for those of us who know that there have now been thousands of, of documents and pages and books and courses. So uh, it makes us aware that Holocaust uh, consciousness is not uh, universal, not universal. So what I'd like to do in my time with you is to really take a look at the history of how the Holocaust became part of consciousness in the United States, um, how the role of Holocaust education, how that's evolved, and sort of a sense of where we are now and, and where we're headed. So um, stick, stick with me here. All right, in the 40s and the 50s, can you hear me okay? Can everyone hear me all right? Okay, so in the 40s and the 50s, uh, the Holocaust was a totally elusive. Very, very few people knew about it, talked about it, um, there was very little, uh, certainly in terms of school um, and curriculum that related to it. And I'd like to give you some uh, reasons why that might have been the case. The first was sort of a, a lack of interest because we now would love to think that the United States entered World War II because of anti-Semitism, because of what was happening to the Jews. That's really just not accurate. That's not historically accurate. Uh, they did not get into the war until uh, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. So that tells us one reason why, especially in the 40s, that really the Holocaust per se was not very much a part of what was being discussed. Um, another reason is that our country was still facing a great deal of anti-Semitism, particularly uh, in the State Department, um, Anti-Semitism was rampant in the United States at that point. Also, uh, we have to remember what was happening historically. The Depression was, you know, had happened not that many years ago. There was a sense of xenophobia in our country. There was a sense of isolationism in our country. So we were, our citizens were grappling with almost anything but what really was uh, the Holocaust, okay? Um, so, some scholars have argued that the reason people didn't know about it was um, the survivors themselves and their inability or their unwillingness to talk about the Holocaust uh, shortly after they came to America. I want to share with you, that's debatable. Some could not talk about it, uh, but I want to share with you one anecdote from my own family that illustrates that some did want to talk about it, but the response of people um, made it made them feel like nobody other than survivors would understand what they had experienced. So in my mom's case, she very much wanted to tell people about the 50 or 60 members of her family that had perished. Uh, and a very well-meaning neighbor in Nashville, Tennessee, where we're living, said, we're so sorry that you had this experience. We had it hard too. We had sugar rations. So when somebody has so sort of trivialized what you've just told them, they really did feel like the only people that could possibly understand their experiences were other survivors. So for many, many survivors, they just really shut down and, and didn't talk about it except sometimes to other survivors, sometimes to, to no one. So that also was one reason that people weren't talking about it very much. Also have to say the role of the organized Jewish community uh, in the United States. Early on, um, they were concerned about anti-Semitism and the blowback. They wanted very much to be assimilated and be Americans. They did not want to necessarily call out their Jewishness. 
Um, and so they, and, and frankly, later on, I think we have to add in the element of guilt and their feeling of what did the United States do or didn't do during this time. So all of that combined was one of the reasons that the organized Jewish community was relatively quiet. Um, I would also say that another thing is that they, uh, psychologically, I think a lot of American Jews, when they saw the images of the survivors, uh, they did not want to sort of um, see themselves as these weak um, people. They had heard that terrible phrase that people went like sheep to the slaughter. That was not how American Jews wanted to see themselves. So frankly, they distanced themselves quite often. Uh, things changed very dramatically. Uh, as we'll see uh, in 67, during the 67 war in Israel, when all of a sudden the Jew per se, and certainly the Israeli, took on a different persona and people were much more willing to identify and affiliate. Okay, all right, let me keep going. All right, so other, other things that really became pivotal moments in this evolution, uh, one was absolutely the Eichmann trial in 1961 in Jerusalem. All of a sudden, people around the world, were, first of all, they were riveted by this case, but they were also hearing for the first time real survivor testimony. So, and it was becoming personal rather than just an abstraction for people. Right? Also, it's interesting how that word Holocaust was used. It actually, the word Holocaust was first a, um, a definition a, um, from Hebrew, the word in Hebrew is Shoah, and it was first used in, I found this interesting, in, the, in Israel's establishment in the, in the Declaration of Independence, and it was Holocaust small age. Uh, after the Eichmann trial, lots of international journalists were there, and they started using the word Holocaust, and they started uh, capitalizing it, which we now, of course, do. So it's interesting to see even the evolution of the word itself. I wanna talk a little bit about how popular culture made under consciousness of, un of the Holocaust come to life as well. The Diary of Anne Frank was first published in 1952, 1952. Uh, then went on to become a film and a stage production in the 70s. Uh, and many of you might remember, I do, those of us are old enough, that in 1978, there was a mini series called The Holocaust. And that again brought to popular culture the stories of survivors and the story of what happened uh, during the Holocaust. Um, also, what's interesting, I think, is that Night was also published for the first time in 1960. The English, the English edition of it came out. Uh, these were touchstones that even to this day are used so widely in schools, um, both um, the Diary of Anne Frank and Knight, okay? And, and they personalized the, the history because prior to that, the way that people learned about the Holocaust was in the context of uh, the military. It was the Nazi assault, it was the occupation of Europe. It had very little to do with the victims early on in terms of you know, how popular culture covered it, how newspapers covered it, how textbooks covered it, okay? Uh, the newspapers, if you look back, you will see that there were articles on the front page of the New York Times, of the Wall Street Journal, of local newspapers that started describing concentration camps, deportations. Um, as the numbers got larger and larger, it sort of faded from first page news to being buried into, uh, you know, and, and, and got much, much less attention. Um, if you want to read a book that really helps illustrate what people knew or didn't know, Deborah Lipstadt's sort of uh, formational book called Beyond Belief was a wonderful way to look back at what people knew and how it was being covered. I think another watershed event I want you to be aware of was 1978. And that was when President Carter established the President's Commission on the Holocaust. Um, I want to read you what its mission was. It was to submit a report with respect to the establishment and maintenance of an appropriate memorial to those who perished in the Holocaust. In addition, 
It called for educational work to be created, and it was going to be the clearinghouse for the exchange of information. It encouraged uh, textbooks to be created uh, to deal with the Holocaust, again, in the context of the bigger umbrella of World War II. It would take another decade before uh, st individual states started mandating the teaching of the Holocaust. It was still seen as sort of a, a Jewish issue, sort of wrapped into some universal interpretation. Um, and to this day, I want you to understand what it means to have a state mandate. To this day, there are different school districts who still choose how they're gonna implement it, how long they will give to the study, uh, what kind of credit or not, how it'll be embedded into existing classes, or in some cases as a standalone course. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. I wanna talk a little bit about uh, te US textbooks and, and its evolution. Um, again, as I mentioned, the early textbooks, when it mentioned the Holocaust, it was, it was talked about in terms of military terms. It was very war-centric um, and victims, particularly Jews, were a subtext. Uh, the framing is very interesting. In 1961, a book came out that talked about uh, the German ideology of creating a super race. Um, it talked about Hitler controlling Europe, very Hitler-centered, without any of sort of the nuance of collaboration or all the other things that, um, including anti-Semitism, that really uh, fostered what became the Holocaust. And it's also interesting how much they paid attention to the psychology of Hitler. Um, they attributed his hatred of Jews to the fact that he was a, a budding artist and that he was not accepted to the Vienna School of Art. Um, it's almost as though they would argue, had he been accepted as a student, we might have not have had the Holocaust. So it's quite a, a, an oversimplification, but that's what some of the early texts, um, how they describe what was happening. All right. In terms of the power of literature, um, in terms of Diary of Anne Frank and Knight, there was a 1990 study done of teachers who were teaching about the Holocaust. Uh, this was in actually in Illinois, and really fascinating. 43% of Illinois teachers used the Diary of Anne Frank, and 39% used night to teach the Holocaust. So it tells us about the power of literature and language arts, which is some, uh, you know, another place that teaching the Holocaust has been deeply embedded. Okay, and then let's talk about, you know, who advocated for, for Holocaust education. One of the first communities that really put itself out there was Skokie, Illinois. And if you think about the reason, uh, in 1975, Skokie was 57% Jewish. 57% and had a very large number of survivors. Uh, in the early 80s, it built a small storefront Holocaust Museum, then a memorial, and in 1990, it became the first state to mandate Holocaust education. Before that, Holocaust education really began in New York in Hebrew schools. And for those of you, that was in the 60s, and for those of you who wanna know about um, Jewish education, this is fascinating to me. At that point, 86% of students went to Hebrew schools across the country, 86%. So, uh, you know, a lot of kids were getting Jewish education and, and that's how they were first learning about the Holocaust, okay? National groups like ADL and AJC started advocating also for Jewish, for Holocaust education, but they did not disseminate or create curriculum. Uh, they advocated for it, okay? Let's talk about integration into the classroom um, and why that was so slow in taking place. Um, three main reasons have been put forth. One is, and this was true in Jewish schools as well as certainly the general public schools. One was, and, and think about how this still resonates in some places for today with, with some legitimacy. One was it's sort of a general discomfort with teaching about death and being concerned about uh, creating psychological harm to students. Another was that in the early years, that it was too close to the historical event and teachers didn't feel at all equipped to uh, open up this Pandora's box, if you will. 
Um, and then textbook companies, as I said, we were creating, the United States was developing a very strong relationship with West Germany. And they did not, the textbook companies did not want to create textbooks that in any way was too critical of, of Germany at that point. So those things I think all help explain a little bit of why it took such a long time for it to be taught in schools. The watershed decade for Holocaust awareness and education was the 70s. Um, and by that time, people were using the word genocide. It had become part of our vocabulary and it was increasingly used to describe the Holocaust. Textbooks were starting to have more uh, pictures. People were starting to see pictures of the ghetto, of the concentration camp, of survivors. Um, and people were starting to talk about anti-Semitism in a different way as, as well. I'm really proud, I mean, we talk about the 70s, I'm really proud that, that Facing History was established in 1976. So they were really early uh, in terms of this whole journey of Holocaust education. I think also one of the things that, that changed was people started hearing famous names. You know how even with this terrible pandemic right now, it's sort of when you hear that Prince Charles has it or that Tom Hanks has it, that somehow people, even if they've been tuned out, start paying attention in a different way. That happened with Holocaust um, understanding as well. When they started hearing about Albert Einstein and other people who, who they, the names that they knew, that they had been survivors, they had, or in that case, had escaped from, um, you know, from Nazi Germany, it became a much more sort of interesting and compelling piece of history that they wanted to know. All right, and then also the very first Holocaust curriculum intended for public schools came out in 1972 and it was in New York. And it was called The Holocaust, A Case Study of Genocide. To its credit, I think this is pretty remarkable, it highlighted both the unique nature of the Nazi genocide and universal nature of genocide. That's certainly a way that I think about it is, is what's particular to that history uh, that honors the particularity, but also what's universal from it that we can apply and understand. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how it's, how it's now used and viewed. Um, the Holocaust in schools can be, it, it's very diffuse depending on the state. Uh, it can be from one to two weeks because of the, the demands on teachers in terms of time and social studies. It can be woven into language arts using the books that I've mentioned. Uh, if we're in, in Memphis, we're super fortunate uh, to have organizations like Facing History. And uh, there are 35 Facing History classrooms that teach a full semester a full semester of Holocaust and, and human behavior. That's, that's critical uh, and in, it was a demand of teachers to say, we need time to teach this and to teach it well. Then you also know that in 1980, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, excuse me, was established, which reaches millions of people and, and is a partner to Facing History. So, you know, when we think about sort of full circles of the video that you couldn't see is when we think about the relevance of the Holocaust, what we, what we know is that uh, teachers see it as an important educational tool to understand human behavior. If you take a deep dive in the Holocaust, you see every imaginable, imaginable uh, type of behavior from a language that we have introduced to being an upstander on this part of the spectrum, to being a bystander, to being a victim, to being a perpetrator. You see it all in that deep case study of the events that led up to the Holocaust, it didn't happen overnight, and the events that took place during the Holocaust and post the Holocaust, how people reestablished their lives. So it's a really compelling watershed event that still continues to teach us many, many lessons. So where are we now? In terms of mandates, 12 states, have Holocaust mandates. Um, Tennessee is not one of them. Um, there are seven states, however, that do have commissions, Holocaust commissions, and Tennessee is one of them. Uh, and to the credit of our, of our uh, commission, it was established in 1984. So that was one of the early commissions. Um, right now, Congress is 
considering what we think is a very important piece of legislation called the Never Again Education Act, which would not only promote Holocaust education, but would provide funding. Uh, as we think, as in a minute, we're going to talk a little bit about what some of the challenges are, and funding is really a major fund, is major, you know, a major important uh, issue that we need to think about. All right, so today, you know, what we've seen is that many teachers rely on textbooks. So who's creating the textbook, how they're covering the Holocaust, is it an in-depth look? That really, that really matters. Some of my colleagues in Facing History have come up with some very important um, things for us to consider moving forward. One of those things is that history really matters. And you can't do justice to the teaching of the Holocaust sort of in a survey course. You can't, it can't be like I learned in, in, I think, a textbook that I had, which was Adolf Hitler came to power and killed six million Jews. You have to be able to look at the small events that led up to it. You have to be able to look at the people who were perpetrators and their motivation and bystanders and the rescuers to have an in-depth understanding and really to learn very much from this. You need also, must have pay attention to pedagogy. Uh, when I first started with Facing History, I worked with some very well-meaning teachers and in their desire to have their children develop empathy they would throw on the most graphic movies, terribly inappropriate for their age, for the age group, particularly if students had not been prepared for it. I can promise you that just seeing, you know, piles of body does not teach the Holocaust well. It dehumanizes and desensitizes kids. So the facing history approach of taking small steps and looking about looking at what ordinary life was like and what led up to this before you get in delve into the Holocaust is a, is a much more appropriate way to deal with it. When I was at Yad Vashem, I will never forget the statement made by our teachers, which was when you're teaching about the Holocaust, you have to bring people safely in and safely out. This cannot be, you know, pe put people in a corner and turn off the lights and ask them to pretend that they were <laughs> in cattle cars, or even frankly to ask them, what would you have done if you were in those circumstances? That's a leap of imagination that just simply isn't fair to ask a young person or an adult to, to think about. So we need, we need time to teach it, we need pedagogy, um, and we need very, very much not to shy away from connecting what happened to the Holocaust to what's happening in our world today. There have been genocides since the Holocaust, and this is not in any way to make facile comparisons. One of the things when I'm working with teachers is to say, please do not say this is just like, because no two historical events just like, but what can we learn? Where are there parallels? Where are the the red flags, where are the warning signs that are happening now that are echoes of what happened uh, during the Holocaust. And so when, when it, to complete my part of this, um, when we think about why we do it, I do want to come back to that video and, and the fact that, that students didn't know what this watershed, one of the most documented events in human history is all about. Why do we do it? Why do we do it? Uh, a, a scholar, Sam Weinberg, wrote, history can be a tool for changing how we think, for promoting a literacy, a literacy not of names and dates, but of discernment, judgment, and caution. And so I think that's why we still do it. So I hope I've helped you look at sort of some of the historical perspective that led to today and kind of where we are today. And after Matab tells you about Israel, then I'm happy to come back and answer questions. Okay? We good? Okay. Matab, it's yours. Okay. Um, I, will, I will say if somebody has a question they want us, I'm going to tell you a bit about um, that these things in Israel during the year. So if you have a question you want to ask now, Rachel, so you can go ahead and do it before I start. And at the end, we're going to have enough time for questions. Okay. And I want, to add, I want to add a couple of things. In terms of Memphis, and I see Bluma here, Memphis has been really extraordinary, not only in promoting Holocaust education, but it's been Holocaust remembrance. We have an annual Yom HaShoah program. 
um, which you know reaches about 500, 600 people. And there's a real commitment here uh, to learning from this history, to honoring the survivors, to memorializing their experiences. And, and now there's a vibrant second and third generation group uh, who feel this obligation and, and frankly privilege to continue teaching about the Shoah and the Holocaust to the next generation. And I really want to thank so much Lauren Huddleston, our teacher who's on here from um, Hutchison, who's a Bells Lipman Award winner. Uh, I've had the privilege of physically going into her class this time. We did an interview with her by uh, Zoom and her students' questions were extraordinary. And that gives me such hope uh, of the interest and, and the depth of their understanding of students. Okay, so do you have questions? Okay, so I will go ahead and start. Um, I have a question. Oh, somebody has a question. Yeah, yeah I have a question. Um, so, Rachel, you said, yes, so I, I definitely think that I, this is Max. Um, yes, hi, Max. Um, so I definitely think that education is one of the biggest parts in, you know, making sure this doesn't happen again. Also, you know, proper education is definitely something that is, uh, is necessary. So I guess what are the factors that go into actually making a mandate or I guess um, creating a commission for each of the states? Because it doesn't seem like very many of the states actually have a mandate in place to actually have it, you know, taught in the schools or like have a commission that basically will help you learn outside of the school. That's a great question. That's a great question. You know, there are actually many more states. Uh, Oregon in, in 2019 was the latest state to mandate this. And there is, um, I think there's more interest in, in doing that now. A again, as survivors uh, and, and soldiers who fought in World War II are passing away, I think as people more and more understand that studying the Holocaust can be an educational tool to help look at how to combat hate and bigotry, um, that there is more interest. But it does take, you know, it, it takes school districts because let's, let's be really candid, they are buying for time. Educators have a limited amount of time to get in subjects. Um, and so they're buying for how do we teach X, Y, and Z and fit in a deep study of the Holocaust. Um, districts know that to do this well, they absolutely have to fund it, meaning sending teachers to professional development opportunities. You can't just hand somebody curriculum. This is not math. This is not two plus two equals four. So, you know, when, when budgets are limited, that question is out there. So I think a lot depends on who's advocating for it. Um, can, you get, can you get that person who is a senator? In, in the case of, of Tennessee, uh, Steve Cohen, who is a senator and who is Jewish, was very instrumental in the establishment of that. So my sense of it is you have to find the right advocates. You have to show, without question, you have to show districts and superintendents and principals why it matters, why it helps their teachers and why it helps their schools. And I'm 100% convinced that once a, 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 head, a head of school or a principal or any of these people I'm talking about have a teacher who's gone to something and comes back and can, you know, implement this in their classroom. They see the impact for their students. Um, that's usually the very, very best way to have this happen. There are a lot of competing claims. So it's not a simple process, but I, I do believe you're going to see more and more do that. And, 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 you know, for a while, I have to be very candid with you. I was concerned about, I still am, concerned about mandates without the other things I was talking about, without professional development, without funding, without, you know, um, oversight, because it can be taught poorly. It can be taught poorly. And, and that's, that worries me. Yes. So I have a question. Yes. Um, I learned nothing about it when I was in school, but I'm seeing Juliana nodding her head a lot. And uh, you must have had a pretty good education about what happened in World War II, or did you, or what was, was your experience? I, yeah, I was actually one of the lucky ones that was a part of the Facing History student group, but I also was very lucky to be able to take the semester-long course of Facing History. 
Um, my teacher, Miss Parrish, happened to be very, very knowledgeable about everything. Um, and not only in that course did we learn, like she said, about the Holocaust, but we learned about other events leading up to it and other events in the world that I wouldn't say necessarily were similar to the Holocaust, but, you know, were drastic as well. We learned a lot about Rwanda and um, things that went on in Africa and things like that. So, yeah, I was very lucky to have upbringing of being taught about it along with being able to also give the opportunity to teach others about it. Can I ask a question? Yes, Jill, go ahead. To piggyback on what Juliana said and also what Max said, I'm just curious. I mean, I, I get, I totally understand the mandate and the commissions and everything, but wouldn't it be more feasible, I guess, to each state to say that we need to mandate uh, genocide education, it, encompassing all of this, and, and it should be across the United States, that it's not just the Shoah, it is Rwanda, it is Dafar, it, you know, it is everything that we need in one package so that it doesn't need to be separated. I mean, I'm just curious, has that ever been done? And I'm just- Oh, absolutely, but, Jill. But, yeah, you're, yeah, you're, you're onto something. I think many, many places, including Canada, and other places are absolutely approaching their governments and the, the decision makers and wrapping it into exactly what you're saying, a study of genocide. Genocide studies has become um, very, very um, interesting and popular. And you certainly see it in a lot of college campuses now, but also you're starting to see that approach uh, as people go to their local governments and their state governments um, and, and nationwide, um, absolutely for that reason, because there's, there's much to be learned from each unique part, each unique genocide, but also what they have in common. Yeah. Rachel, Rachel, how many states do you suppose have hate crime laws? You know, I don't know. That's a great question, and I really don't know. And again, part of the, the, part of the real problem, Tennessee does not, and part of the real um, problem is you know, for people who didn't want it separated out, they would say there's already laws on the books that talk about, you know, discrimination and, and so they don't need separate hate crimes. Uh, I think there's now, and Bluma, you can probably speak to this better than me, there are more states that are sort of putting that into place, particularly sort of with the rise of, of white nationalism and other, you know, more recent events, they are really separating that out and, and having to, you want to speak to that, Bluma? What, do you know anything about sort of hate crimes in states that may have laws about that? 46 states. Yeah, I, don't have, I don't have the specifics on it, but you're, you're absolutely right what, what you're saying. Where did you chat? Juliana has the answer. Oh, you do? Tell us. Unmute, unmute. Un unmute. Just unmute. Google it. Um, this is what came up when you Google, you know, how many states have have uh, hate, um, hate law, and this is what came up. So how, how many, many states? It says 46 states in, in D.C., the District of Columbia. Okay, so that's that's very much a growth in the last, you know, few years because of that, you know, there were not that many states who separated it out. So that's a trend. But what, what makes it complicated, Rachel, and you can talk to this better than I can, is that when you learn the history of Weimar Germany and how it devolved into a failure of a democracy, it starts with it starts with uh, uh, taking away freedom of the press, taking away uh, having discrimination laws. It's 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 a more it's a it's an evolution that made uh, resulted in the show up. Right. And for me, that's that's the value of teaching this in a way it gives you context and historical references. Because we have the same kinds of things, only not to the same degree, going on in the 21st century. Correct, correct. But and I have, think, steps. go ahead, Paul. And I, and I, yeah, think, we have, I mean, we have, we have issues of, of hate and bigotry all, all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Paul, I think you're absolutely right. I think one of the reasons, and, and probably Lauren can speak to this, one of the reasons I think that, that students who are taught well and who immerse themselves and have enough time connect it absolutely 
connect it to what's happening in real world and in their own lives. And I, I, I can tell you a couple of experiences from I first started going to classrooms in the 70s, in the early 80s. And I remember going into East High School and talking about my family's experience, which I, I often do. And this precious child who was African American uh, came up to me afterward and she said, I can't believe white people did that to other white people because her whole you know, paradigm of oppression had always been black and white. Right. And so I think the teaching of this, and so I can't tell you how much the teaching this history also resonates for minority children, for children who have gone through trauma, for children who have you know, uh, fled war-torn countries. They absolutely see why this is relevant, this history is relevant to them, and why, you know, I also often say this is human history, it belongs to them, it doesn't just belong to any one group, and um, I think it makes it, again, very, very, very relevant for them. I, I always, always include what happened to the handicapped, you know, this whole notion of a super race. I think the more we can make people see themselves in, in this story while honoring what was particular about it, the more it will continue to be relevant well, well into the you know, next generations. It can't be just a museum piece where right. we study it in, in a vacuum. You, you're right, the word context is hugely important in doing this well. Any other questions before we turn to Israel? Okay. Matav, you want to take it? Yes. Um, so thank you very much. I'm sure that people will still come up with questions. So like, if you have something come to your mind, just write it down and then we'll have uh, more time to ask questions later. Um, so, well, I will say in Israel, the first year Israel was established in 19, uh, 1948, and the first year's um, first decade was very similar to what Rachel described. Um, there was a big separation between the old Yeshuv, like the people that lived in Israel, um, in Palestine, to the people that came from Europe, okay? Um, and the Israelis, the new Israelis, that Sabar image, they created this ethos of the Israeli is like this brave person, um, proud, hard worker, work the land, protect his land. Like this is, was kind of the ethos of the Israeli, of like the Jewish people in Israel. And when the people, the Holocaust survivor and the people from Europe came to Israel, they couldn't feel like they didn't get the understanding from their brothers in Israel. People, um, people were like kind of, way I have the word, um, repress, repression, yes, um, the Holocaust. And they didn't wanna say like, this is us, this is not part of us, we are different, people in Israel are different, we have different life. And for many years, until the Eichmann, the Eichmann trial, um, this was the situation, it was, this time was called the Great Silence because the people that came from Europe, the Holocaust survivors who came to Israel felt very uncomfortable sharing their stories, so they just didn't. Um, and for many years, people did not talk about their experiences and like what happened to them. Um, and the only way that the Holocaust was talked was about the uh, heroic part, uh, the partisans, the people that fought, um, the combat Jewish people that, you know, resistant in this way. Um, and in 1959, uh, 19, when the law for, um, for the Yom HaShoah uh, started, so it was called Yom HaShoah Vagvura the day for the Holocaust and the um, heroes, like it, it was mostly talking about the heroes and all the other people were just left aside. So this is the first year uh, years in Israel. And then we have the Eichmann trial that this was the turning point because it was, well, it was a public trial 
and it was interesting for people. And there were 100 testimonies, live testimonies. And suddenly people in Israel realized that this is, this is the first time people actually heard what happened. And the definition of what being a hero in the Holocaust means changed for people. Um, so this is a new period in Israel when the Holocaust become a national um, memory not just for the Holocaust survivors, it's not just them, now it's ours. It's, it became, beside just their memory, it became a part of the Israeli memory as, an, as a nation. So this is a really big and important point in Israel history. Um, <clears throat> and then it's amazing that well, Rachel was talking about how in, in the United States, the education about the Holocaust started in the 70s, something about like that. In Israel, the education for the Holocaust was in law, like what became obligatory in the schools in 1980. So only 1980, which is amazing, Israel is like 31, 32, only in 1980, mm -hmm was obligated to teach about the Holocaust in Israel, the Jewish state. Oh, it took that long until it became um, part of the education in Israel. <laughs> until there, there was stuff going on, but it wasn't like part of the curriculum that people like the student has to uh, learn about. Um, and then the 80s is where there was uh, another change, a new period of time um, regarding the Holocaust in Israel. And we have like the education starting, we have the trips to Poland, that if you don't know, so it's a big tradition that senior years in high school are having a trip to Poland. Um, I went on a trip to Poland, it was for me, uh, one of the most important things I did in my life, it really changed. <laughs> I'll tell you about myself in a minute. I'm, I'm not really, I'm like my family's from Iraq, they're Kurdish, they are the other side, like is in Israel for generations. I, I didn't have, I don't have any like family relation to Holocaust, the Holocaust of like, and no Holocaust survivors in my family. And even though I was like, I studied about the Holocaust since I remember myself, every year we have like a, a ceremony in school. It always felt like something very not mine. Like, okay, it happened to my people it felt as a, as a child also many years ago, but it's not like- We lost her, there. What? We couldn't hear you, we lost you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so I said that um, even though I was studying about it all my life, I still didn't feel connected until I went to, to Poland to the trip. And you know, it's a full year that she's learn so much and you like you just change all your perspective about the holocaust and just being there um it's incredible so this is a really big project that started in israel it actually started in the 60s but then uh it stopped and it really came back just in the 80s um sorry and if i will talk about like the 90s until today. So we are looking in a really different um, time when the Holocaust is changing to kind of a more private um, memory, okay? If until, until the 90s, the 80s, we were looking at the Holocaust as a national memory, it's like, you know, one of the things that Israel, um, like the Israel, the establishment of Israel is based on um, kind of like this big event and like all these things. So in the 90s, we're starting to talk about the individuals in the war and all the ways that we commemorate the Holocaust start to fit into this um, um, way by more hearing stories, more talking about victims, talking about specific survivors talking about specific displaced people and it really fits our like our 
period of time now that everything is like more about, you know, I am, so it's really just, that's how the Holocaust is going to um, as well. <clears throat> An example for that is the project Le Kol Ish Yashem. Um, Le Kol Ish Yashem, it means each person has a name. It's a famous song um, and it's a project that is in Yad Vashem. It started in the 50s when Yad Vashem decided that they want to um, have collect all the names or as many names they can of the people that died of the 6 million people. Um, and in the 90s, started a ceremony in Israel that in national ceremonies, we like read the names, some of the names uh, of these people. So like there is really a big focus on the individual, um, in the individual experience and all this kind of aspect. <clears throat> Something interesting that I, well, when I was reading about um, and I find really fascinating is that until today, there is not a legal, um, <laughs> not a legal um, ah, definition for Holocaust of Israel. Okay. Israel 72, there is no legal definition. Um, there is no one law that is um, explaining what are the rights that all of the survivors in Israel are like deserves to get. Um, there are several laws. The first law <coughs> was um, in 1957. Um, and it, this is the main law that, that, that the rights, the Holocaust survivors in Israel uh, was based on, but it didn't mention what Holocaust survivor is. So it's really interesting to see how the definition of Holocaust survivor by law changed during the years. Um, and but uh, something else that is very uh, interesting uh, regarding that fact is that because the definition has changed during the years so many times, so you can see that in the past few years, um, the number of Holocaust survivors suddenly increased. And it's weird because you say, okay, Holocaust survivors, they get old, um, a, lot of, a lot of them pass away. You have like 100,000 of them dying every year, but the number increased because more communities are included, like becoming included in this definition by law. So this is another thing. And another interesting fact is that unfortunately, almost quarter of the number we have today in Israel, one, 193,000 um, Holocaust survivor. Almost a quarter of them is in poverty, okay? Um, and this situation is really, like it creates a lot of, um, I don't know the, the exact word for that. <laughs> um, I don't have the word, but it's a very like complicated situation. Um, Holocaust survivors in Israel in 1952, Israel made an agreement with Germany. It's called the payment agreement. And in the agreement, Germany paid the Israeli government a big amount of money in uh, for all the crimes, for all the damages that um, the, the Germany, well, the Nazi Germany did. Um, and when Israel decided on this agreement, so it actually decided also for its Holocaust survivor citizens that they cannot go and sue Germany for money their rights, all the money that they deserve to get is only um, going to be in front of the Israeli government. So because we don't have the definition and because Israel is, has all the money, so a lot of people that are not included in this um, specific law that define in different ways what is Holocaust survivor, so they just don't get the money they're supposed to and they're old people and they just get yeah. it really unfortunate situation. Um, and I think that's it. I want to tell you about a special project we have in Israel, but before I do that, I'll just let you ask questions if you want. And also, Rachel, if you want um, to add something. Okay. 
I, I was just going to add that one of the things that's been remarkable in terms of um, Israel is the arts and how over the last couple of decades, um, because absolutely the, the Israelis shied away from talking about it for all the reasons you've said, um, and a lot of survivors did not talk to their children. We know of cases where people literally did not know that their parents were survivors. It sort of came out sometimes deathbed kinds of things, but it was quite often now the children of survivors who have created amazing films and, and books. They've really used the arts as a way to deal with, um, with the Holocaust. And you might want to speak to, I mean, one of the, the, one of the very first kibbutzim that was created, was created by a group of survivors um, in Israel, if you want to mm -hmm. speak about that at all. Um, so there are, well, it, there is a kibbutz Lohamea Gutaot, um, it's in the northern part of Israel. I think there are even more than just one. But I feel like in the first years um, when Israel, you know, when I told you Israel didn't really talk about the Holocaust and Holocaust survivor kind of stay like a closed community and they didn't really speak. So um, they kind of stay in a community and there are kibbutzim that was established by um, Holocaust survivors. And today they're also dealing with um, a Holocaust education. So when, before I went to Poland, so we went to this kibbutz and they have amazing programs um, to educate about the Holocaust. Um, and I will say that Israel I put aside all the unfortunate, um, you know, uh, economic situation that the government might not handle as 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 good as we would want them to. But there are amazing nonprofits and organizations and um, people in Israel that do their best to help um, and to educate. So besides Yad Vashem, that most of you know, so there are amazing programs. There is a program called Cafe Europa, like Europe ca Cafe, um, that is like clubs for um, Holocaust survivors and they get like just the social experience. There's a lot of young people go and volunteer there. Um, there it's like it's in many cities now. So this is an amazing project. Um, and there is also Zikaron Masalon that I will tell you about uh, in just a minute, because I had a really, really interesting interview with uh, one of the managers of this project. I hope I will show you the video if it will work. Um, and yeah, that's it. Any questions? Okay, so I will say that, well, one of the things that I find interesting, um, you know, I got to spend Yom HaShoah here and in Israel. So also it's a question that I will, and we can open the discussion. I will um, ask you, Rachel, is what is the difference that you see between the commemoration of the Holocaust in the Jewish communities and um, the non-Jewish population um, in the United States? If you see there's a big difference or um, like, well, it's an interesting question. I think that if you look back in Memphis, when years ago, when the survivors, when Yom Shoah, for example, was first created, um, if you looked in the room, it was survivors and their families. It was not a big communal gathering. It just simply was not. And it has grown to become that, um, both through the, you know, the commitment of, of the Federation, um, and, and, and others, it's become owned, that experience become owned and accepted by a much larger group of people, including, you know, non-Jews, uh, you know, this, we get more and more people who are not in the Jewish community who come every year, whether it's teachers or students, they're now, you know, contests for students to get involved with. Um, we want it to grow. We want people to understand again, that, that the Holocaust is a, a piece of human history. It's as much about Christians and what they did as it is about Jews. And so it's really important that the commemoration now becomes a way to bring together a, a broad group of the community. While I wanna be really 
clear about this while still honoring and commemorating the experiences of survivors, because that's really who, you know, that's who this is about, while we're still fortunate enough to have them. And, um, and so I think, you know, it's interesting, I think in terms of how the non-Jewish community commemorates it, I have seen it commemorated and spoken, in, uh, for example, in VA hospitals, because it's a natural connection, right? If you've got World War II soldiers who fought, that's a very authentic connection to the history. Uh, I've seen, uh, I spoke one time at St. Anne's at a Catholic school. Some of the schools have now started having commemorations. So I think it's sort of still a new area of, uh, of growth and of exploration uh, in terms of the non-Jewish community. And I, Bloom, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, you know, anything that you've seen. Yeah, I agree with everything that you say. I would just add um, that it is hard to get young people to come to Yom HaShoah. Um, we are getting more and more young people through um, trying to have a teen moment, which brings teens, and trying to do the art and the essay contest, and that brings teens. But it is a very different mentality. I mean, I grew up like it wasn't even a question. You go to Yom HaShoah. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a choice. Um, it was just something that you did. It was just part of your, you know, your obligation to the Jewish people and to history. And I think that sense of obligation. So you have, on the one hand, you have the trend that you're saying of people becoming more educated and going because of their education and awareness. But I think also parallel to that, you also have the trend of a decrease in people feeling an obligation to go to those um, community-wide commemoration. So like both those things I think are happening at the same time in parallel with each other. And so I think, I think related to that, and Matav, you've been doing this, I, I think we need to get creative, right? I think um, having you and other young people on our committees, really thinking about how do we make, the, how do we do in addition to, not instead of, but in addition to the big community commemorations, how do we make it more intimate? How do we do it in people's homes where they're hearing stories? Uh, I think we're just sort of at the beginning of understanding how to make this relevant to this next generation outside of the classroom. Um, thank you. So I will, well, I will say that the question of how the Holocaust, the memory of the Holocaust, education to Holocaust is going to look, um, I don't know, in like 20 years from now. I'm not even going that far, you know, away, like 20 years. Um, it's a big question because we're trying to see um, how to keep young, younger people, they're not related. And I told you, I'm like, I'm not even as young, like they're much younger people. <laughs> when I was young, I didn't feel so connected to it. And I was in Israel and it was everywhere. Like I was, I studied about it every year and we had ceremonies when you have everything. Um, and I still didn't feel so connected. So it's a really big question of how are we going to um, keep this memory, like this collective memory uh, going on for the next generations. And I think that one of the interesting initiatives that started in Israel in 2011 is the Zikaron Basalon project, um, which we had one here in Memphis, I think like two months ago, um, two, three months ago. And this project is, well, it's based on a very simple platform. People meet in a living room, someone's living room. Zikaron Basalon, it's memory in the living room. That's the meaning of the name. Um, in Israel, it's in Yom HaShoah, only like in Yom HaShoah. Um, and they have like more intimate uh, gathering, um, they watch, or it's either they bring a, like a survivor to test, like to say it's testimony, or they watch a recording testimony, or it's like a second generation. So they found a way to have the testimony part and they have a part of just create something. So it's like creating music or like um, reading something about it. So any, any type of like creating something together and discussion. And I feel there are like a lot of interesting stuff about this uh, concept that um, offer 
the younger generations um, a place to connect to the Holocaust from a different place that is more relevant to them than just the history books in school. Um, and well, with your permission, I have a, I will try to share the video with you all. I hope that it will work. And if it will not, Okay, so I had a short interview with Osnat, she's the managing of this project, and I asked her some of the questions that I will later uh, bring up here um, for you to discuss. And Matab, I just want to be real conscious about the time. It's 8.16. Yeah, Can so we I'll say, I'll, you know, hard stop at 8.30? I know. So I will okay. show just like one question that was, um, I think, the most important one about this, and then I will open it for you for less questions. Um, Okay. Here she is. Yes, I'm just trying to find the question that I wanted. Um, and if somebody wants to bring a question while I'm doing that, so go ahead um, and talk and I will find the question that I wanted. While Matab is doing that, I think what I would be curious about, and we don't have a lot of time, is if anybody wants to sort of share what was sort of your first connection to this history, uh, when did you first learn about the Holocaust? Just anything you might want to share about, again, about your own connection to this. Um, okay, so I learned about the Holocaust when I was in Hebrew school in New York. And my first most vivid memory is watching a movie called Night and Fog. Oh, that, yes. <laughs> Yes. And how old were you? Oh, dear. Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, I okay. was, um, I, I, I want to say I was under, it was before I was bought mitzvahed. Okay. So very, very young. So that, that's the kind, that's an example of the kind of film I would never suggest a teacher showing uh, students until they were well, well versed, perhaps you know, well into high school because it is one, it's, it is one of the most graphic Holocaust, um, you know, documentaries that's out there. Right, yeah, I've never forgotten it. Yeah, I'm sure you have. <laughs> okay. Tom, are you able to show it or should we move on? And so I will just share it with you um, like I did with the other um, video. Um, and I will bring it up here. So she said that their goal as a project um, Sort of a condition that is similar to the to this Passover, like seder, to our seder. Like none of us were in Egypt when Israel, the Jewish people, um, was walking in the desert, but we still celebrate um, Passover um, as part of our, you know, Jewish collective memory. Um, and they are trying to create sort of tradition that people, you know, automatically in Yom HaShoah will have this gathering of remembering um, and, you know, just doing this small act in memory of the Holocaust and tell the story of the Holocaust. Um, so I'm interested just to hear like what you think about it, if you think that it's relevant to everyone, if you think that it's relevant just for the Jewish people, um, just to hear what you think. Any thoughts? Audrey, Audrey, tell us what you're saying here. Hold on, can you say it? I lost it. Audrey, can you unmute and tell us, did you write something? Did you type something in? Oh, they just, they, they wrote a different my, Yes, my question was about um, conversation groups and connections for children and grandchildren of survivors, but I got two great um, responses from Juliana and uh, and Bluma, so maybe it might be nice to share those those links and contacts with the whole group okay. to, to spread. Audrey, are you not on our second gen list? Are you telling I me? I am about not. Getting... So we can yeah. fix that, though. Uh, we can fix that so easily tonight. <laughs> okay, we'll fix that. We'll fix it. Thank you. Hey, anything? Piggybacking on that, is there any, like, for non 
generation things. Are there any continuing education type seminars or things like that for adults or young adults that are no longer in school or not family related Holocaust? I think absolutely. I, I think I, I know that Facing History does, as particularly right now, a lot of virtual, um, you know, uh, what, pet, what, what am I trying to say, podcasts or web, you know, web related things. So I would check that out very regularly because they're, and they're always sort of great conversations with scholars of the Holocaust, all sorts of things that are open now. And, and given the coronavirus, we just learned today that almost all the resources, even things that had been only available for educators are now accessible to teachers and students. Mm -hmm. So that's one great, I know, I know that the museum, the national, you know, the um, Holocaust Museum in um, DC also runs a tremendous number of um, online, you know, seminars and on sort of, so there, there are great resources. Yad Vashem does too. So I'd go to the big things and take a look at that. And then, and then I you just want to make a commitment to, to you and to others that through the, the relationship with the Holocaust Committee of, of Yom Hashoah, we are eager, super, super eager to see how we can best uh, serve, you know, second and third generation and others who are not you know, just let us know what you want and we can, we can bring great resources to bear. And I love Matav's idea of bringing it to a small group in somebody's living room. <laughs> I think that's a great way for people to build community. So uh, I think this is a great start tonight to, to see where we go from here. So I hope you feel like you've learned something and, and how this has all evolved. And, um, and Matav, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you, Rachel. Much thank, you. thank you all. Thank you all. And stay safe. Matab, any last words? Well, I will just say we will use the last minutes if you want to write. Um, I'm going to just write you all my email. And if you want to do something, um, just email me. So I'll have you in my list. Um, it will be easy. Um, I'll send you all the videos and. It, more information to read we can like get all this stuff together and thank you all thank you all so much and stay safe Mwah. sending virtual hugs. Night, everybody and jill will talk tomorrow so glad you could be part of this thank you bye 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 That was Aud Aud Audrey at the. Uh, uh, Bye, Audrey. Um, See you soon. Bye, Lewis. Bye, Jill. Bye, everybody. Carol Bachman. Bye, sweetheart. Good night. Good night. I'm trying to close the conversation, so thank you again. And I hope okay. Matav, you and I can stay on for a minute, okay? Good night, Carol. Okay, uh, let's see who's still on. Car Carol, are you still on? Lewis, are you still on? Yes, okay. <laughs> I'm leaving, I just forgot how to leave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for the... But actually, Rachel, I have a question. Can I ask Sure, you? sure. So, you know, my mother's family was decimated by the Holocaust probably 50 members of her family, but her, her parents came here like 1920. Uh-huh. But uh -huh. her family was left in Poland and, uh -huh. and decimated. Does that make me a second generation or not technically because my, um, yeah, I've, I've never, want, I, I've wondered, um, it's such a great question. Yeah. You know, I think it's such a great question. You know, it's how I feel about somebody who wants to be Jewish. It's like, if you want to be considered that, right. and want to be part of the group, come on, you know, come on. And we have, for example, we have some people in the group who are married to second right. gen. 
and right. they are super interested. So I would never um, hesitate to say, Let, if you want to be on the list, come come be part of the group. I right. But technically, is it more that you're where your parents themselves escaped or the, the definition now, the, 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 the broadest definition of who a survivor is, was created by the U.S. Holocaust uh, Memorial Museum. Right. And it sort of encompasses people who were displaced right. during World War II. So that enabled us, for example, right. to consider uh, people who went to the Soviet Union, right? right? They weren't, as, or, or people, you know, who were in hiding or people yes. who, so it was displaced people. It didn't have to be people who had physically been in a slave labor or concentration right. camp, right. which I think is a much more equitable way to think about it because you right. didn't have any choice to flee and go to Siberia. Right, <laughs> so, right, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right, sweetie. Good night. Thank okay. you for coming. Oh, there we go. Okay, good night. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Sure. <laughs> Lewis, we still have you? <sighs> Lewis? <laughs> we see you, but we don't hear you, but we see your picture. Good night, good night Lewis. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I think it's you and me. Well, I think, I think it, what do you think? I think it went well. I think that it went well. It was targeted to everyone, which is hard. It was hard what? I, I like to see like the faces when like, yeah. talking and I talk and like I was rolling, uh, you know, the people all the time to see how they look like and like someone yeah <laughs> it's hard it's hard it's hard but at least but at least i feel like um i think people appreciate having the opportunity to be in a community even if it's this way rather than i'm, I'm so glad you suggested it because you know i was thinking about we should just cancel it but i'm glad we didn't and i think for the people who came they felt like they got something out of it and they were appreciative. And um, so I'm glad we did it. I'm really glad we did it. Good, I'm glad. And yeah, I, I agree. And I have to tell you that all the other stuff that I was on Zoom had like maybe one, two people joining it. Uh -huh. Exactly. <laughs> also a really good group, like working people. It's nice. Um, yeah. Okay, so I hear you coughing a little bit. Are you okay? Oh, I'm okay. I'm I'm just when I'm speaking a lot in English, it just makes me like oh, okay. <laughs> so you need a big glass of water sitting there. <laughs> I, I I never really stop to breathe. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Well, unless there's. I got. I just got a bunch of texts from people that said it was really good. So. Awesome. Awesome. I'm so glad. So glad. All right, sweetie pie. Well, unless there's something else, we'll, we're going to say good night to each other. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye.